Hi there, my name is Don Liu. I uh, hold the NEAG Endowed Chair in Literacy and Technology here at the University of Connecticut uh, and uh, direct the New Literacies Research Lab. Uh, we do work in uh, new literacies in school classrooms, K-12, here in the U.S. anyway, from about ages 5 through uh, 18 uh, internationally. And so um, the issue then is what are these new literacies and why are they so important? Well, um, I guess the take we, we make on this is that uh, uh, the Internet is really a literacy issue using information, reading and writing and communicating and so forth is really a literacy issue and we see these as new literacies that are somewhat different from traditional reading and writing skills uh, uh, because new tools, new technologies, new social practices are all involved in them. And uh, in addition to that, it's not just that they're new today, they're new every single day of our lives because things keep changing on the internet. And this notion of change is central to our work, uh, both in the theories that we've been developing as well as in the research and in the instructional practices that we have. It's a, it's a real challenge from a theoretical and research point of view, for example, that the thing that we study keeps changing on us. That is, literacy today is uh, different from what it's going to be tomorrow because there'll be a new tool, a new technology that will be available for us for reading and writing. So what are these new literacies? Well, to us, um, these new literacies are the skills, the strategies, the social practices, the dispositions uh, that are required to use online information effectively to learn. Um, now, there are many different definitions of what new literacies are, but to us, that's, we're concerned about learning and we're concerned about preparing our youngsters for these skills, strategies, social practices, and dispositions that will enable them to use online information to learn new things about the world around them. Um, we focus on one particular aspect of new literacies in what we refer to as online research and comprehension. And what we mean by that is students' ability to conduct uh, independent and collaborative research uh, to learn new things on the internet. It, uh, we see it as comprised of several different elements, uh, locating skills, uh, evaluating skills, uh, evaluating the reliability of information that you find on the internet, uh, synthesizing skills or putting together information from multiple sources, and then communication skills which includes all kinds of new technologies that are required uh, uh, to uh, pick people's brains, see what they know, look for ideas, and then also finally to communicate what you've learned with other people. So we've been spending the last five years developing a performance-based assessment on a large federal research grant uh, called uh, Online Research and Comprehension Assessment, or ORCAS. And so we've developed about 24 different ORCAS, uh, performance-based assessments that give students a problem to solve online, and then we um, evaluate their ability at every step of the way. Uh, it takes place in a uh, simulation of the internet with a search engine and web pages and wikis and emails. And it's driven by an avatar that uh, text messages into the student to sort of direct them and ask them different questions and engage them in the research project and so forth. So anyway, we've developed these assessments that are highly reliable and valid, and, uh, but they're also performance-based. They're not multiple choice. And so they actually ask students to do a research project. And now we're looking at a lot of the data we've collected in two states, a uh, laptop state, Maine, and a non-laptop state, uh, um, and evaluating uh, students' abilities in this area. So what have we found in the work that we've been doing? Well, um, a number of things. Uh, one uh, uh, important concern that we have in one of our studies between a, a wealthy and an economically challenged school district is that uh, kids in the two districts appear uh, to uh, uh, manifest a separate and independent achievement gap in the ability to conduct online research, separate and independent from reading and writing skills, traditional reading and writing skills, which we've um, controlled and found a, a separate achievement gap on the ability to conduct online research. Um, uh, largely because the schools in the poorest school districts are so constrained by state assessments, assessments that have uh, none of these skills on them. So those schools are under great pressure to raise test scores and that's what they teach. They teach none of these uh, new online reading and writing skills, whereas in wealthier districts they have much, many more degrees of freedom to and flexibility about what they're going to teach. They certainly feel the press of state assessment and test scores, but 
they experiment and include a lot uh, more innovative practices and as a result their kids get opportunities. Kids get opportunities also uh, differently at home of course but in schools it's a very clear uh, difference between the two. We've also found that students, um, and we tend to look at seventh graders, uh, middle school students, uh, the weakest area for them is uh, critical evaluation. Uh, they don't uh, uh, think very critically about the information they read. And as a result, they tend to believe much of what they read. They tend to only go to a single source and not question the author. Uh, and they don't have skills that uh, would allow them to carefully evaluate the reliability and expertise of an author. Um, communication is also a problem uh, at this level. Uh, that is, skill, skills such as uh, 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 writing in a wiki, writing in a blog, uh, writing a summary of what they found in an email message and so forth. Um, those kinds of skills are um, uh, second most difficult for our students. They tend to do better in, in synthesis, which is really related to their offline skills of summarizing that they've learned. Uh, and then uh, finally, they uh, do reasonably well on locating, but they're, they're, a lot of them are, are clickers and lookers. And what we mean by that is that they, when they get a set of search engine results, they start at the top, click and look to see what it appears like, and then they work their way down the list rather than reading search engine results critically in picking on the first click the best choice for them. We've done other research as well in terms of instructional models and so previously we worked and developed an instructional model in one-to-one -one laptop classrooms called uh, um, IRT, Internet Reciprocal Teaching. We, there's a really interesting problem that you face when you're trying to teach with, uh, in one-to-one -one laptop classrooms and that is that you have about uh, 15 seconds of attention and after that uh, the kids are off on their own and so we tried to figure out how are we going to teach some of these critical evaluation, these locating skills, these synthesis skills, these communication skills in a classroom when we have 15 seconds and the answer we came up with uh, that works pretty well is that instead of teaching you give students a problem and in, to solve and in that problem you embed the skill you want to teach and then when you see a student uh, manifesting that skill uh, that student teaches the rest of the class. And if you don't see a student manifesting that skill that you've embedded in the problem that's uh, important to solve it, then you uh, work with one of your weaker performing students and you, you sort of scaffold their learning until they get the idea and then they teach the class uh, to do this. So an example would be if you're trying to teach critical evaluation a source, you give the students a problem like, uh, here's a three-part problem for you today. We've got, uh, I want you to find the height of Mount Fuji. We've been reading about Japan. Uh, after you do that, uh, that's an easy one, then find a different answer to the same question. So find somebody else who says, no, it's a different height. Then, then the third part of the question is who's right and why? And uh, so we give students that problem to work collaboratively in small groups and uh, then we monitor um, them in a little software tool that puts thumbnails of uh, every student's laptop on your uh, laptop so you can watch what they're doing and when you see somebody uh, evaluating source that is clicking on a link that says who we are or doing a search for the 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 site the, the name of the site to see what people are saying about it uh, then we ask that student to take over and we project their laptop screen up on the uh, the smart board and then have them tell everybody else what they were doing as they solved the really key part of that problem which is uh, who's right and why so Internet Reciprocal Teaching, or IRT, is really a three-phase model. Um, and I described the second phase of uh, uh, developing these strategies that are important for online research and comprehension. The first phase is a nuts and bolts phase where you just go through some of the, the mechanical things. What's a wiki? What's a blog? How those work? How different search engines work? Uh, locating skills if your students need them. Only the skills that are really required in your classroom, of course. And then the third phase, once the kids have uh, developed a pretty sophisticated understanding of the uh, uh, skills that are required for online research and comprehension. Then uh, we take them into the final phase, which is uh, 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 conducting an online collaborative project with at least one other student in another part of the world related to the, on a problem related to the curriculum that uh, makes the world a better place. Those are the criteria we have. We build these uh, up to this point, by the way, by having uh, collaborative uh, uh, classroom projects throughout the 
phase one and phase two. We tend to use ePALS, uh, a, a wonderful tool for connecting classrooms from the, around the world. You can quickly find teachers in many parts of the world that are interested in collaborating with you. But there are other tools as well. And um, so they practice this collaboration as a whole class. And then when we get to phase three, when they're ready to do online research, they've developed a network of friends in other parts of the world. And, so uh, they have to come up with a project and get it approved by the teacher. But here's an example of one. So um, these students in Connecticut uh, 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 shared the problem they had with other kids around the world on their, on their uh, list of friends in an email message and said, look, we've got to do this project. Do you have any ideas? And a student in South Africa actually popped up and said, yeah, why don't you do a, uh, create a web page about Gary Paulson? We're reading about Gary Paulson. Uh, uh, an author at that age, uh, and uh, put a web page together with links to all of the resources you can find online, and uh, then you'll have a research site for kids who want to do research on Gary Paulson in their school, and that'll make the world a better place, and that's related to the English language arts, uh, the, the course, the class that you're taking right now, so uh, why don't we do that? And then a bunch of other kids chimed in and said, yeah, yeah, let's do that, let's do that and uh, said, I can help, we'll send you the links. And uh, these two students in Connecticut said, okay, we know how to make a web page. Our teacher showed us how to do that, so send us the links. And so they built a web page about uh, Gary Paulson. And uh, uh, so that's an example of an online collaborative project. But there are many, many different types of projects. Uh, we just think that it should be something that connects the skills that students have been learning into a global context, because that's exactly where our kids are going to be working when they're adults. They'll be working in environments where they'll have to collaborate and problem solve and uh, work with um, many other people from other cultural contexts from other countries and uh, to solve whatever problems they face in their workplace. So let me talk a little bit about school leadership in this area. It's probably one of the most important areas uh, as we think about the changing nature of literacy and learning in school classrooms with the internet. Uh, for several reasons. First of all, everything we know about the research on school leadership is that school leaders drive change. That is, change doesn't happen unless there's a, a school leader with a vision uh, for the change uh, uh, that they're, um, that's needed. Um, so school leaders have to have this vision. They have to understand what's going on and the changing nature of things. But it's also constrained right now, at least in the U.S., by uh, Common Core state standards. Um, because you can, you can look at those Common Core State Standards with uh, the lens to the past that most of us have and only see what we've been doing in school classrooms. Or you can look at Common Core State Standards. Few people are starting to look at it with a lens to the future and understanding each of those standards in terms of what it really means to learn and communicate and read and write in online context. So let me give you an example of what I mean by a lens to the past and a lens to the future. So the first anchor standard is close reading. That is, we want our kids, I'm going to summarize it here, we want our kids to be able to read carefully, closely uh, with information, but also to make inferences about the information that they encounter. So traditionally we've taught that in reading comprehension through discussion, through levels of comprehension questions and so forth. And that's one way of implementing close reading. But with a lens to the past. But if you take a lens to the future, you would see that reading search engine results is really the, one of the best examples of close reading because there kids have to read make it very carefully, make inferences about what those short little segments are telling them about the information they're going to find behind that link and make an inference about whether or not that source is the best source for them given their particular needs. So to me, close reading really involves helping students read carefully and make inferences about search engine results so that they can be more efficient when they're trying to locate information. Um, and that's what we have to do as we look at these common core state standards. Each one of them can be looked at with a lens of the past or the lens of the future. And it's really important that all of us look at those standards with a lens to the future and think about how does this common core state standard really play itself out when we're reading and learning and communicating online. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a real key as we think about leadership. If you can see that, then you're in a position to really help your teachers and help your students prepare for their future.